IT was the dismissal and flight abroad of Robert Mugabe's oldest and trustiest lieutenant that finally led to his downfall. Grace Mugabe, the 93-year-old president's avaricious wife, was thought to be behind the sacking. Younger than her husband by 41 years, she plainly sought to inherit the throne. Yet she overplayed her hand. Within a week the armed forces commander, alongside an array of generals, declared, without naming her, that Mrs. Mugabe must be stopped. He demanded, also without naming names, that her nemesis, Emerson Manangagwa, must be reinstated as heir apparent. Mrs. Mugabe's allies were denounced as counter-revolutionaries who had played no part in the War of Liberation that 37 years ago had brought Mr. Mugabe pictured to power. A few days later armored troop carriers rolled into her array, the capital. Soldiers took control of the state broadcaster and surrounded Mr. Mugabe's residence. In the small hours of the morning another general announced on television that the army was in charge. But the coup was not a coup, he insisted. Various traitors had merely been rounded up and the Mugabe family detained for their own safety. Mr. Manangagwa was set to return from his brief exile. The Mugabe era was at last and gloriously over. As the economist went to press, events were still unfolding pell-mell. But the latest signal suggests that the fate of Zimbabwe, at least for now, is in the hands of the 75-year-old Mr. Manangagwa. Upgrade your inbox Receive our daily dispatch and editor's picks newsletters. Known as the crocodile for his habit of waiting quietly before sinking his jaws into his next victim, Mr. Manangagwa has none of his erstwhile master's wit and charm. A former guerrilla and longtime political prisoner during the era of white supremacy that ended with independence under Mr. Mugabe in 1980, for the next two decades he was Minister of State Security and of Justice. He acquired a fearsome record of repression and an unrivaled knowledge of where the bodies, literal and metaphorical, were buried. A pragmatist to the core, Mr. Manangag was first act on the day he took over his department in 1980 was to visit the police station where he had been tortured by the white regime after his capture for trying to blow up a train. The Ligorans from which he had been hung upside down were still there, as were the white officers who had beaten him. Yet, according to an account by Martin Meredith, a historian, he promised them a clean slate in the new country. Soon enough, however, he was making his own use of such men. He is accused of complicity in the brutal suppression of the minority Debele tribe in the early 1980s, when about 20,000 people, most of them civilians, were murdered by the Zimbabwean army. He denies this. He had a hand in the Zimbabwean army's deployment in the 1990s to the Democratic Republic of Congo, which it plundered. In 2008, when Mr. Mugabe and his ruling Zanif party lost a parliamentary election and the first round of the presidential one, he orchestrated a lethal wave of violence that forced the winning challenger, Morgan Svingeri, to withdraw from the second round. Standing for election to a parliamentary seat against the main opposition party, he was himself twice embarrassingly defeated. But Mr. Mugabe ensured he would always retain a senior government or party post. In the past few years, as Mr. Mugabe's physical and mental powers have declined, Mr. Manangagwa has fostered a reputation, with Western governments among others, as a man to do business with, and is the president's likeliest successor. Well before the coup, one Western diplomat remarked that he would be ruthless and powerful enough to grab power quickly should it slip from Mr. Mugabe's hands, with at most a few tens of deaths forestalling a drawn-out power struggle that could result in a lot more killing. And he has courted multilateral financial institutions such as the IMF and World Bank. Mr. Manangagwa has also let it be known that he would reverse the racist indigenization law that requires businesses to be mainly owned by black Zimbabweans or by the state. He has argued for some kind of settlement, including compensation, for the white farmers whose properties have been confiscated since 2000, acknowledging that their skills are needed to rebuild what was one of Africa's most productive agricultural economies. Such a settlement might spur Western governments to start offering large-scale aid again. On the domestic front he has put out secret feelers to the opposition, hinting at a unity government after Mr. Mugabe goes. Fall from grace that happened faster than expected, once Mrs. Mugabe had persuaded her wobbly husband to dispatch his senior vice-president into the wilderness on November 6, egged on by the president's outrage after she was booed at a meeting. Mrs. Mugabe's bid for power has had a long gestation backed by a relatively younger coterie of Zanif ministers known as the G40 Generation 40, she had already managed to eject one rival, Joyce Majuri, from the Visa presidency in 2014. In gunning for Mr. Manangagwa, a few days earlier she had described him as the snake who must be hit on the head, it seemed she was finally bidding to replace her husband.
At a church meeting earlier this month, it was reported that she declared she was ready to succeed him, saying I say to Mr. Mugabe you should, leave me to take over your post. The former secretary, who had become Mr. Mugabe's mistress as his first wife lay dying, did not realize how despised she is within the ruling Zanif party. She rashly picked fights with two of its sturdiest factions, the Securocrats and former Bush fighters, in her bid to eliminate rivals for the presidency. Yet the biggest fall was not that of Grace but of Mr. Mugabe himself, a man who was among the last of Africa's presidents for life. His reign lasted so long that the vast majority of Zimbabweans remember no other ruler. And he bragged that it would continue until God says, come join the other angels. Despite his viciousness and incompetence, he was hailed as a hero by many Africans. Some saw in him a symbol of resistance to the old imperialist powers. At meeting after meeting of the African Union, he could count on a rousing ovation, as he railed against whites and the injustices that he imagined rich countries, chief among them Britain, and mysterious groups of home ills, were inflicting on Zimbabwe. Yet for all his bluster, blame for the immiseration of Zimbabwe rests chiefly on his shoulders. His ruinous policies caused the economy to collapse, impoverished his people and destroyed their health sea charts. That need not have happened. For a few years after independence, Zimbabwe prospered. Mr. Mugabe shelved the blown Marxist economic policies he had espoused during the years in prison and in the guerrilla camps. He allowed the white farmers, who had once wanted him dead, to preserve Zimbabwe as the region's breadbasket. There was an unwritten understanding, he felt, that they should grow food and tobacco but keep out of politics. He was far less tolerant of the Dibeli, a minority ethnic group who continued to back his long-standing rival for national leadership, Joshua Nkomo. He pretended that scattered instances of banditry amounted to a massive armed revolt, and ordered his North Korean-trained 5th Brigade to crush it. The massacres, torture and rape he inflicted on the Dibeli were on a larger scale than anything that occurred during the long war against white rule. In those early days, Western governments and aid agencies, keen to promote Zimbabwe as a donor-funded success story, generally looked the other way. During the 1990s, however, corruption began to erode Mr. Mugabe's authority. Towards the end of that decade, a group of aggrieved and landless war veterans, many of them obvious impostors, successfully agitated for big handouts, after complaining that they had missed out on the patronage dished out to the bloated elite. This blew a hole in the budget and caused the IMF to withdraw support. Instead of pulling back, Mr. Mugabe spent more. Have you ever heard of a country that collapsed because of borrowing, he asked, as he opened the taps on spending and threatened to grab white-owned farms and hand them to his supporters. Soon after, he called a referendum on a constitutional change to bolster his power as president and enable him to confiscate land without paying compensation. At this point, in 1999, a trade union-led movement rose up, with the help of some whites, including some of those farmers that are too protected by Mr. Mugabe in return for their quietly prosperous life. After his constitutional proposal was voted down, by 55% to 45%, he lost his temper, setting off a reckless campaign of land grabs. In remarkably short order one of Africa's most advanced economies collapsed. Short of taxes and revenues raised from the export of crops such as tobacco, the government soon began to run out of money. Gideon Gono, then governor of the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, simply printed more of it. Traditional economics do not why apply in this country, he said. I am going to print and print and sign the money, because we need money. Inflation reached 500 billion percent, according to the IMF, or 89.7 trillion percent, according to Steve Hank of Johns Hopkins University. Measuring hyperinflation is hard. At the same time, Mr. Mugabe embarked on a murderous campaign to quell the opposition, led by a courageous if sometimes clumsy trade unionist, Morgan Svingeri, who refused to give up. In 2008 he Lee defeated Mr. Mugabe in the first round of a presidential election, while his party won, more narrowly, the general election. Mr. Mugabe was evidently shaken to the core, perhaps, like so many dictators, because he had come to believe that his people loved him. For five weeks, a cow electoral commission refused to divulge the result, eventually massaging the figure of Mr. Swinger a victory down to just under 50%, thus requiring a second round. The mayhem that then followed was so vicious that Mr. Swinger I felt obliged to bow out. Eight months later a unity government was formed. A dollarized currency had begun to rescue the economy but Mr. Mugabe failed to implement any of the major reforms that were meant to restore a semblance of democracy. Mr. Svingeri and his party had been tricked, humiliated and discredited by the time of the next election, in 2013, since when the economy has plummeted again.
No one knows the exact figure, but a good 3 meters Zimbabweans, some say 5 meters, out of a population now estimated by the UN to be nearly 17 meters, have fled the country, to South Africa and overseas. What next? If Mr. Manangagwa succeeds in taking back the reins of government, his first task will be to consolidate power within Zanuf. Whether Mr. Mugabe formally hands over or is kept on as a kind of ceremonial president is barely relevant, though it would be neater if the old man were ushered into as dignified a retirement as soon as is feasible in these ugly, humiliating circumstances. Mr. Manangagwa's main concern will be to ensure that Mrs. Mugabe and her G40 are dismissed. Many have already been locked up. Big wigs who will probably sink with her include Xavier Kasakuwer, who enacted the racist indigenization law Ignatius Chambo, the finance minister Jonathan Moyo, a serial plotter and former regime mouthpiece Patrick Zuau, a nephew of Mr. Mugabe and the head of the police, Augustine Chihori. A Zanif Congress originally scheduled for next month, at which the top spots in the party are dished out and endorsed, may be brought forward. A drastic purge of anyone suspected of siding with Mrs. Mugabe is likely, and could be bloody. The formal coronation of Mr. Manangagwa, or his anointing as the undisputed heir to the throne, is likely then to take place. It is possible that Mr. Manangagwa may call for a government of national unity in the run-up to the general and presidential election, constitutionally required by the middle of next year. If a president dies or resigns, the ruling party has 90 days to nominate a replacement, who then completes his predecessor's term of office. The opposition is woolly fragmented, though its main leaders have made progress in the past year towards forging a broad front. Mr. Svingarai, much diminished by his five hapless years as Prime Minister in coalition with Mr. Mugabe, who ran rings around him after the bloodily disputed election of 2008, is probably still Zanuff's chief opponent. But he has cancer and several of his ablest lieutenants have defected from his movement for democratic change. Ms. Majuri, for a decade Mr. Mugabe's vice-president and long a prominent figure in Zanuff, might ally herself to Mr. Svingare party. Simba Makoni, a decent former finance minister who defected from Zanuff, won 8% of the presidential vote in 2008. A respected banker and former industry minister, Nikosana Moyo, has set up a new group. It is vital that the opposition coalesces behind a new leader. No obvious chief contender has yet emerged. Outsiders, in Africa and beyond, are offering to help. The two African bodies previously most involved, the African Union O and the Southern African Development Community SADC, a 15-country regional club led by South Africa, are sure to make high-minded noises, but their readiness in the past to whitewash Zimbabwe's rigged elections and to wink at the violence and deceit that kept Mr. Mugabe in power for so long give no comfort to Zimbabwe's battered opposition or to its benighted citizens. Few trust them to give the real opposition, rather than Zanuff factions opposed to Mrs. Mugabe, a fair deal. Zimbabwe is bankrupt. It needs the IMF, the World Bank and an array of Western creditors to forgive debts and offer fresh loans. But that must be strictly conditional on political reform. Foreign aid agencies already feed many Zimbabweans who would otherwise starve, in some years, millions of them. The most pressing requirement is for a properly supervised election. Given the failure of the O and SADC to monitor past polls properly, it is essential that beefier bodies, including the UN, the European Union and the Commonwealth from which Zimbabwe withdrew in 2003 after its suspension the year before, supervise the next vote. American bodies that are experienced electioners such as the Carter Center and the National Democratic Institute must be involved, too. The elders, a group of former world leaders, including Kofi Annan, once head of the UN, and Jimmy Carter, a past American president, could advise. Olushigan Abasanjo, Nigeria's shrewd former president, has been suggested as a mediator. Since Mr. Mugabe expelled the Swedish head of an EU mission that was monitoring a presidential election in 2002, he has almost never again let in such intrusive bodies or such dignitaries, especially any that smack of past colonial rule. Old party stalwarts, including the coup leader, General Constantine Chiwenga, and Mr. Manangagwa himself, have opposed what they call neo-colonial interference. Sometimes China is cited as a friend that, unlike Western powers, will dispense aid with no questions asked. But of late it has had less willing to bankroll Zimbabwe. If a new government wants economic help, it must accept a measure of oversight. Outsiders will not dispatch the aid needed to set Zimbabwe on the path to recovery unless its new government is clearly representative and respects human rights. Zimbabweans are resilient. Their country is rich not only in natural resources but also in talent, much of which would return home if the country were better governed. Zimbabwe's infrastructure is still better than in many other African countries.
During most of his long tenure, Mr. Mugabe and Zanif did their best to ruin the place. Mr. Manangagwa may be the man to oversee the post-Mugabe transition, but as soon as possible a new generation must take over and make a completely fresh start.